Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and today we're going to be deciding which reactions from introductory organic chemistry are actually useful. So this is inspired by a comment on the Cursed Molecules tier list, and since so many of you wonderful people upvoted this, I decided to make this video even though I thought it would be a challenge. So let's get started. As I talk through each reaction, each reaction is going to appear in this little box down below. So let's start with the Haloform reaction. A Haloform reaction is where you start with a ketone and you chlorinate the alpha position three times. This then results in the formation of a carboxylic acid and a halo form. Now this reaction, while it's one that's used to make chloroform, for instance, from acetone, it's not something that most researchers would use on a regular basis. Normally we would just buy our chloroform. And so while this reaction can occur, the only time you'd really look at using this is if you're trying to figure out why a side reaction happened or something. So the halo form, even though we learn about it as if it's this really important reaction, I would put it right into F tier. I don't think it's actually that useful, but it is kind of an interesting reaction. It goes without saying that I expect this episode to be really polarizing. Let's talk about the Jones oxidation. So the Jones oxidation can be occasionally useful, but it's rather harsh, and it also uses chromium, which makes it not ideal. High valent chromium salts are really carcinogenic, and most of the time now we want to avoid using it. Does it occasionally have applications in total synthesis and whatnot? Yes, but I would say best case scenario, Jones oxidation is probably going to have to be D tier. Now let's talk about hydrohalogenation of alkenes. You learn this reaction in undergrad, you're told, yep, yeah, you can predict regioselectivity based on the substitution pattern of the alkene. Sometimes you'll get mixtures, and in practice, almost no one uses this because you usually require the anhydrous gas. And even so, if you took something like anhydrous HI or HBr, it's going to do other chemistry as well that you don't necessarily want to do. So while this looks good on paper, in practice, very few people actually use this. I've only used this reaction once. This is a little bit anecdotal, but I would say in general, people look at more selective methods that are reliable. So this would be like the conversion of alcohols to chlorides or bromides or iodides which is just a more reliable reaction because there's better ways to install alcohols than there are halogen groups to alkenes. Does this mean that there are no examples? Of course not, there are plenty of examples, but it isn't as useful as it's taught it to be. So I'd say we can put this one right into E tier. Now wolf kishner reduction. Maybe you didn't learn this one in undergrad, but some people did for sure. This is the conversion of ketones to CH2 groups. This one can be really useful, but the disadvantage here is that it uses hydrazine. Now there are variants that have been developed using tosyl hydrazine, and those can be converted under milder conditions. But that being said, it's still a rather niche transformation and you don't see it used that much. It's not like everybody does one in their day-to-day -day operations, maybe once per year. It's nowhere near that frequent. It's fairly niche and people tend to only use this when it's absolutely necessary. So I'd say wolf kishner reduction probably also belongs in E tier, maybe even F tier, because it's not that nice of a reaction and it's really, really harsh. Now the halohydrin reaction. The halohydrin reaction gets some use occasionally in total synthesis. It can also be used occasionally to synthesize epoxides. Normally when you see people using halohydrins to make epoxides, it's because they're unfamiliar with alternative methods to make epoxides from alkenes using contemporary methodology. So I would say we can be a little bit harsher on this. Now it does have uses. So like macrolactinization, instead of adding an OH to an alkene, you can often do intramolecular cyclization reactions, and these work really well when you have like an iodonium or a bromonium to promote the reaction. Now that being said, Beyond that, they don't have too much use, and I would say probably this one can go into D tier. This one does have some uses in industrial processes, so I'll put it into C tier just for good measure. Now the Deals Alder. The Deals Alder is IOC50, the video that hasn't happened yet, and uh, a couple people in the Discord are asking, so when's that Deals Alder video going to come out? It's going to happen, it just maybe it'll be for Christmas. I promised Maurice, one of my Discord mods, that I would make it for Christmas, and so if you are interested in learning about the Diels Alder reaction, make sure you stay tuned for December 25th. So the Diels Alder reaction is really useful. The reaction that you learn in undergrad is that you take 1,3-butadiene, and that reacts with ethylene, although that actual reaction doesn't work. You need to have a more activated alkene, something like an electron-deficient alkene. Normally the diene is also electron rich, so the reaction works better. And this has got studied a lot in a lot of different contexts. Now, some of the things that the Diels Alder suffers from is mixtures of endo and exo products, as well as getting enantiomeric mixtures. So you end up having a mixture of enantiomers and diastereomers, unless you carefully choose your starting materials and they happen to not be that chiral. So I would say there are some limitations for sure. Do they have applications? Yes. Are there enzymes that have Diels Alder raises? Yes. So, you know, it's a relevant reaction, and this is one of the few cases where having a biological application will make me rate this higher. I will put this in D tier, 
as it is the archetypal sigmatropic rearrangement. Now that being said, I still think putting it in B tier is very generous. Ketalization. Ketalization is super common. I think most researchers at some point will be doing this. It's quite common to protect ketones and aldehydes by converting them to ketals or acetals. It's a very useful reaction for masking a ketone. I think this one probably has to go into like A tier. Not quite S tier because it isn't like run of the mill every day you use this sort of thing. But it is common enough that it deserves to be an A tier. Definitely useful. So hydrogenation. Easy S tier. Hydrogenations work really well. Normally you see this done with palladium on carbon and hydrogen, although alternative conditions do exist. Lots of people do hydrogenations routinely. If you want to do selective hydrogenations, there's good chemistry established for that as well. And so I think in general, hydrogenation, it's an S tier reaction. It works really well. LAH reductions. LAH is another really common reagent. The reduction of ketones, aldehydes, etc. is super duper common. Is it harsh? Yes. LAH is one of the harshest reagents that we routinely employ in chemistry. And oftentimes in papers like OPRD, you'll see examples where aryl halides and other functional groups that you don't really want to touch will get touched anyway. And that's because LAH is very harsh. In a research context, that's fine. Like you don't care if it's like a 60% conversion. You can do a column, purify it out, but it's not ideal for industrial processes. Nonetheless, S-tier reaction works really well, fairly reliable. LAH from a solution is generally nicer to work with because LAH in the solid state generally disproportionates to lithium hydroilluminates that are like uh, hexa-coordinated. Michael additions, another really useful reaction. Our body makes glutathione, which is a really good Michael donor. And what this means is if you generate any really electron deficient alkenes, that your glutathione, which is a tricked out cysteine, is able to just go and react with it. So Michael additions really common in a biological context, also really common in a synthetic context. Now what the nucleophile adding to the Michael acceptor is can vary quite a bit, but it's a really good reaction. I think Michael additions probably belong in S tier as well. Oxymercuration. Almost no one uses this. I don't remember the last time I saw an oxymercuration used in a paper. It's pretty rare to see heavy metals used, even if this is just for like political reasons. But overall, I'd say oxymercuration is not commonly employed. This is similar to hydration of an alkene, which is an experiment you might do in your undergrad organic chemistry class. You get the same product by doing oxymercuration, just the oxymercuration works a lot better. The same way you get an iodonium or a bromonium, the mercury can do the same thing, and so it makes it easier to add the alcohol group. But then you have to use a reducing agent like sodium borohydride to reduce away the mercury after. So having to use an additional reducing agent and using mercury, it's not ideal. I'd say oxymercuration in practice belongs in F tier. Now let's talk about ozonolysis. So ozonolysis is really powerful, and occasionally you'll see it employed in a really clever way, and it'll solve a problem in a total synthesis, for instance. But practically speaking, it's a really harsh methodology. And you can do a lot of useful stuff, like you can get different products depending on how you work it up with different reducing agents. But in practice, it's a really messy reaction. It can also cleave amino groups. It can oxidize them to amine oxides. Ozone is a very harsh oxidant, so it can do a lot of chemistry you want to avoid. But that being said, it has been useful historically. So because it's been historically useful, I'll put it into D tier. But in the modern age, it's just very rarely employed. Is it still useful? Yes, everything potentially has a use, right? Even if it's a very nuanced tool for a very specific purpose, it, it could still have applications. Now, the Swern oxidation can go right into A tier. The only reason the Swern isn't used as often is it forms dimethyl sulfide, which is really unpleasant. Swern oxidations are extremely reliable. In almost any instance, if you follow the original Swern oxidation prep from the paper, it will work almost every single time on almost every single alcohol. Now, if you're working in total synth and you have really funky alcohols, you're kind of the one-off. You're the exception rather than the rule here. And so in total synth, you have to screen every reaction because you're not sure if it's going to work. And the solution to your problem might solve your problem, but it won't necessarily solve anybody else's problem. So I'm going to like put the total synth people to the side here. If you have a normal alcohol and you want an aldehyde, the Swern oxidation will usually work. I would say there's more precedent using the Swern or the PCC than there is DMP oxidation. Swern is easy A tier. Now, speaking of PCC, I think PCC is a good reaction, but it's fallen out of favor due to the presence of chromium. It does still get used fairly often. You know, if you're in a group with more than 10 people, you could probably come up with two people who've used it in the last year, but it isn't used as much as it used to be. So we'll put PCC into C tier because it's still a really useful reaction, really good way to get aldehydes and ketones, although it is falling out of use. Now, osmium tetroxide dihydroxylation. 
Most of us don't want to work with osmium tetroxide because it's horrendously toxic. Additionally, it's expensive, so people don't really want to pay that much for it anymore. There are alternative methods to do dihydroxylation reactions, and so occasionally you see variants using those, although occasionally you do still see osmium tetroxide used. There are alternatives using like potassium osmate. You see some stuff like AD mix beta, which has osmium derivatives in it, which are functionally similar. But the original osmium tetroxide dihydroxylation is almost not used at all now. I would say we can put this into like E tier because occasionally it gets used, but it's very rare. Now the Wittig reaction, S tier reaction. We don't necessarily use it as much as we used to, but when you use it, it works. Maybe you'll get a mixture of E and Z products, but it will work. Wittig reactions are really reliable, and sometimes it's just a matter of screening conditions. Wittig created a great reaction, and we're very fortunate to have it in our tool belt. Now, wagner mirvine rearrangement. This is the shift of a hydride or a methyl group. While this happens a lot in total synthesis, and it happens a lot in certain processes, it's not something that you usually want to happen if you're doing synthesis. This is the type of thing that makes a mixture of products and reduces your overall yield. So I'd say this is not a nice reaction, even if it does exist. So it's more of an important consideration of when stuff goes wrong than when stuff goes right. Occasionally, you'll see someone employed in a clever way, but overall, it doesn't see that much use. I will say probably D tier, and I know this is probably controversial because carbocation rearrangements, they're everywhere. Yeah, they are. But usually when they happen, you didn't want them to happen. And now you're just explaining what happened to make yourself feel better. Halogenation of alkenes. So the halogenation of alkenes is a reaction that works pretty well. You don't see it used as much because typically once you have those two halogens there afterwards, you have issues of selecting which one you want to do chemistry with. You will see them used occasionally, but beyond bromine, you're not going to be working with chlorine. And the di iodo is usually too unstable. So this is essentially limited to bromination of alkenes, Br2 addition to alkenes. And even bromides are a little bit too reactive, so you don't see them used that much. But hey, it has bromine in it, so we'll put it into B tier. Fischer esterification, really good reaction. You can get this reaction to go really far, especially if you have something like a Dean Stark trap to azeotrope off the water that forms. You can usually just mix any alcohol and any carboxylic acid with a bit of sulfuric acid or toluene sulfonic acid, and it'll just work. Maybe you'll only get like a 30 or 40% yield, but it will work. It's an old reaction. It's a dirty reaction, but it's a good reaction. You don't need to make an acyl chloride, so there's no thionyl chloride involved. You don't need to use some fancy coupling reagent. Unless you have something really sensitive, Fischer esterification is a great cheap way to make esters. Good reaction, S tier. Even though it's not an S tier reaction, it's S tier in terms of its utility. Now, hydroboration. Hydroboration is useful. Most of the time, you don't have the very specific case where you're trying to make a secondary alcohol over a tertiary alcohol. Usually it's like a secondary versus another secondary. So people end up having to trick out the borane to try and get more selectivity due to the steric bulk of the Y groups on the borane, such as something like pinnacle borane or 9BBN. And you do still see this used occasionally, not as much as you'd think based on what you see in organic chemistry. And I think that's just because the next step involves peroxide and you just don't use peroxide as much in synthetic chemistry. Can you use it? Sure, but most of the time you don't use it because it could do a lot of different reactions. So hydroboration, I'm gonna put in B tier as well. It's like useful, but it doesn't get as much use as it used to. Now we have a few reactions left. Let's look at the aldol reaction. So the asymmetric aldol reaction with proline is one of the most useful reactions in organic chemistry because you can get a lot of stereocenters really quickly, which means you can have an antioselectivity and you can oftentimes get diastereoselectivity too. Now, if we compare that to the original aldol condensation reactions, those products are a little bit less useful, but the aldol reaction in all of its forms has a lot of utility. There's also retro aldols. You see it in biological contexts. Aldol reaction is another easy S tier reaction. Now the birch reduction. The birch reduction is pretty sucky. You learn about it like it matters and you almost never use it. If you were to pull like a hundred organic chemists, I bet only like five or six out of that 100 would actually know the regioselectivity of a birch reduction, and that's because nobody uses it. Do you really want to work with anhydrous ammonia? I know I don't. Are there ammonia-free variants? Yeah, sure. There's even been total syntheses on the channel that I've featured in the last couple months, which have utilized ammonia-free birch conditions. Now, that being said, there have been variants developed by, for instance, Phil Barron doing an electrochemical birch, but most people have not adopted that yet. So birch chemistry, yeah, there's probably like 100 people on Earth right now using it, but beyond that, it's not a great reaction. I would say birch reduction, it's kind of cool, but actual utility is not that cool. We can put it right into E tier. Now the Grignard reaction, easy S tier. Grignards are super useful. 
Once you halogenate something, you can convert it to a Grignard reagent. You can convert it to the umpalong. So instead of having a C, which is electrophilic, you can have a C, which is a nucleophile. So that's pretty useful. You can add it to ketones, aldehydes, you name it. Grignards are super useful. Easy, easy S tier. Now, last but not least, we have Friedel Crafts. So Friedel Crafts is a reaction to add in an alkyl or an acyl group. The issue with alkyl chloride alkylation is you often have that wagner mirvein rearrangement that you might not want, although it can still be a useful reaction. So industrially, it's relevant. There's a lot of different reactions that are relevant industrially that aren't necessarily relevant to the lab scale. Although I personally have used a lot of Friedel Crafts type alkylation and acylation chemistry, and it tends to work fairly well. Is it clean? No. Most people don't use it as much as they used to. So I think we can be a little bit harsher and put that into D tier. So hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to check out more tier lists, we've got plenty on the channel. And I hope you have a great day.